we'll get started. Um, welcome to X Talks. I'm Molly Robertson with Residential Education and Open Learning, and today we're thrilled to host Dr. Keith Baker from MGH, who will be talking about cognitive science of teaching and learning. So I just wanted to give a short introduction to Dr. Baker. Um, we're thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much for coming. Dr. Baker is Vice Chair <coughs> of Education in the Department of Anesthesiology at MGH. His peer-reviewed articles focus on evaluation and feedback, attributes of excellent cl clinical teachers, and deliberate practice as it relates to the development of expertise. Please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Keith Baker. Uh, I very much appreciate the invitation. It's a real treat to be here. I like your staircases, too. They're very they're classic. Um, so I train doctors. That's, I'm an anesthesiologist. Uh, my PhD is in neurobiology, voltage-gated K-channels. I won't be talking about that. Uh, but my other background is that of a, a chemist. So I try and bring what I think is the science of learning to the process of training doctors and other people. So if there's not a measurement behind it or an experiment demonstrating that it is so, I'm likely to argue <coughs> with the, the statement. So what I've done here is tried to present studies that demonstrate a concept. A lot of the studies you'll see are not in uh, easy to find journals. They have to be ripped off and transferred to other journals that then make education easier to see. If you want any of the journal articles, send me an email. My email is at the end of this. It's khbaker at partners.org. I'll show it to you again at the end. I'll send you any article you want because you're welcome to have them. So I don't, I don't have any businesses. It's not my gig. And this is, these are really important caveats, and particularly for this audience. I don't know you all well. I don't know where you're coming from as far as what you know. I might tell you stuff you know. I'm sorry if that's the case. It, no matter what, I'm sure there's stuff I'm going to leave out and, and some stuff that you might say, geez, how did he not talk about that? It's so important. If that happens, I'm sorry, because I, I know that'll happen. There's stuff I want to talk about I can't talk about. Not enough time. And I'm going to simplify topics. To go through a paper in great detail means going through materials and methods and all that stuff, and the whole time will be burned up with one paper. So I'm going to do little concept pictures, and you'll see how that looks, and uh, you'll see. But sometimes I'll say, this shows that, and it, in general it might be true, but not for every single person. So this is the outline, and this is how I think of learning. I think of learning, I call it stuff, knowledge, like my name, my address, my dog's name, how much I weigh. That's just information. And in the, in, in the area of Healthcare, you got to know a lot of stuff. And so my, my learners want to know how to learn more stuff, so I, I get busy learning how to help them do that. Another thing that this interests me a lot more is this concept of understanding. That's what I actually care a lot about. You need to know stuff to do the understanding, but there are processes that lead to better understanding, deeper understanding, more efficient getting of understanding, and I'll talk about that. And then this is what I spend a lot of time with in my, with my faculty. We've made the terrible mistake of thinking that because these people are smart by standard tests, you know, the MCATs and the SATs, that you just tell them something and they got it. And nothing could be further from the truth. And we seem to be able to think that if we tell them something, it'll be good to go forever. And I'm going to show you what I think are these fantastic limitations in how the brains, our brains, your brains, process information that really limit what can be accomplished by the human brain at a certain time. And then, because I'm going to make the claim that failure is a normal part of learning, it's certainly a normal part of doctoring, uh, you have to have a mindset that lets you address failure in the most effective manner available to then improve yourself. And that's uh, another thing I, I particularly believe in, with data, of course. So um, I used to be a program director. For 15 years, I ran the residency over at the Mass General for Anesthesiology. It's the second biggest residency at the hospital. And so I got to see lots of residents, like, you know, hundreds of them. And these are smart people, you know. They go to good colleges like this one. They make fine grades. And then they come to the, they do the residency, and you talk to them, and they say, I know I read this. Honestly, I, I highlighted it. I know I did. I don't remember it. And something, something particular happens. And I'm, I'm quite impressed that, that they claim this. So there's this sort of inability to learn stuff at some point, and, and this is what it looks like. So I'm going to go over just a couple things. You probably have heard of some of these things. You know some of these things. But I'll show you the, some of the studies that have given rise to remembering more things or stuff. So the first thing is a concept of retrieval. People have always thought of retrieving information as testing, and that you sit and read. And that's what I did. I went to the library, and I would read. And I'd study. 
and that's retrieval. I mean, excuse me, that's, that's um, encoding. That's where you just learn stuff. But the concept of pulling it back out on purpose, that was called the test. That was an assessment method. And it turns out the process of, of retrieving it, the testing of the information, is actually quite a good uh, learning uh, method. So here we take our college students. I don't recall which college they went to. But they, they ended up learning Swahili words. And they use Swahili because nobody knows that. It's a great test environment. So they teach them the word in English, like boat. And then there's the Swahili word for boat. And they learn all these words. The key is that they initially learn the words to 100%, meaning at one point they can at least put down boat as this. At, at that point, and only after they initially learned it, so there's no issue of did they initially get the information, they're randomized. That's my little symbol for randomization. <coughs> they then get to restudy the material. That's how I went to college, like restudy, go to the library. Or they had to retrieve it, which means they would show you boat. You'd have to sit there and say, oh, what's, what's the word in Swahili? And put the boat word there in Swahili. And if you couldn't, you got to go look back at boat and try it again. So you were allowed to fail. And if you failed, they'd give you the information. But you had to retrieve it, and you could keep doing this. They then sent them home for a week and asked them to come back to the lab after a week. And then they said, well, who learned more of these words? And that's the answer. A tremendous, tremendous, this is one of the largest effect sizes I've seen in education. The effect size, or Cohen's D, is four. Four standard deviations better on average than the control group. It's a huge difference. And then there's another funny word down here called metacog, that's my slang for metacognition. It equals zero. And what I mean by that is these people all thought they learned the words. The people who didn't learn the words thought they learned the words. The people that learned the words thought they learned the words. So they didn't actually realize, the people who, who uh, did the restudy, that this was a failing technique compared to this. So they were completely unaware of it. So I would say that this retention concept, uh, how long things stick, depends on what you do with the information. If you look at it and read it, that's getting it in. When you pull it back out and you retrieve it, my name is Keith, I live in Lexington, my dog's name is Bruce, whatever it is you want to pull back out, if you do that, that process does something synaptically and causes the ability to remember that information in a much longer manner than otherwise. So that process is, I think, quite important. So when I'm learning something and I come across a new medicine that's hard for me to remember because nowadays they spell them with vowels only, uh, they're terrible, <laughs> you really ha you have to literally do this because the, the medicines, they make no sense. The, whoever invents these names is, I don't know, <laughs> it's a special business in medicine because the medicines are unpronounceable but I actually have to do this. <laughs> Spacing is a, a thing that uh, I have to, I can use for our residents too, our learners. We go back to the same paradigm here where they learn these Swahili English pairs. They're then randomized to one of six uh, ways to, to practice. And so they get to restudy. That's just, I've already showed you that. They get to recall the word one time. So it's a single recollection on the test. And then there are four versions of retrieval. The mass retrieval, short spacing, medium spacing, and long spacing. And what we have here is, again, we go back to my dog, whose name is Bruce. Uh, we'd say, what's Keith's dog's name? Keith's dog's name is Bruce. It's Bruce. It's Bruce. That's mass retrieval, all at once, no spacing. If you said, what's, where do I live? What kind of car do I drive? How tall am I? What's my dog's name? That's short spacing. And if you space that, if there are many more filler words, that would be medium spacing. And a lot of filler words, that's long spacing. So the question is, does the spacing out of retrieval events have anything to do with what you can recall a week later? So they go home, they get taken back to the lab, and then we see who remembers what. So there you go. This, to me, is what my poor residents, this is the existence of a medical doctor at the Mass General. They read it. The next week you talk to them, and like, oh, I did, I read it, I know I did, but it, it's not there. This is typical. A single retrieval helps a lot, and massed retrieval does nothing. If you do it all at the same time, there's no benefit to, a, to three massed events, and we have know this now for a lot of different things. Mechanical stuff, learning hand-eye coordination, massing your practice is not nearly as good as spacing it out over time. And you can see here for short spacing, right here, medium and long spacing, the longer you space it out, and still are able to recall it, the longer you will remember it into the future. So, so once you forget it, you've gone too far, and then you have to re-encode it. But if you can space that out, and space it out even further, you're going to do better and better as far as remembering stuff. 
This is Vogue, from what I can tell, taking notes on computers. So when I was a medical, or even a you know, medical student too, um, they didn't use computers in school, they used pencils and paper. We used to voice record the lectures, some person would transcribe them later, but not, at, not live because we didn't type very well. So what we're going to do is take our students, they are all going to watch a video, a little, a little talk, and they're told you're going to get a, a test on the talk, and you can take notes on the talk. And when you take your, your, your notes with a laptop and you do your typing, this group here gets 30% more, more, more words onto the paper, and they get a lot of verbatim stuff because the young people type very quickly nowadays. <coughs> it's very impressive to watch. And the other people were given the, the pencil and the paper. Uh, they then are sent home, are brought back for a week later, and they get their notes back. They get to study their very own notes, and then are given the test. So ostensibly, this group should do better as far as they got more words, they got a lot more verbatim stuff on there. And then they're given the test on this lecture that they all saw the same exact lecture. But such is not the case. So it's not an intuitive finding. Those who take notes with their hands are doing something or processing in a manner that makes the information more meaningful as opposed to just acting as a pass-through item where you simply get information in and it ends up on the, on the, the uh, computer. This is a little closer to home. This is Harvard students learning, learning statistics. Um, and what they've done here is they have taken the, the students, and like all good studies, there's a randomization, and they're all given a lecture. It's a five to seven minute lecture on a topic. I don't know, the T test or something. And at the end of the lecture, they are either given questions about that lecture, given questions and the answer about that lecture, or told to do some filler math processes, you know, I don't know, some algebra or something. Not related to statistics, but some sort of math, so it's germane. Statistics and math are related, so they get to do that. Then they get a separate lecture that's set on a different topic. Maybe it's, I don't know, the medians versus means or some such a thing. And same thing, questions, questions and answers or math. And then the last one, they get a, a new lecture still, a different topic. And on this one, they're going to get a test at the end of this. They're not going to do all this stuff. So they all watch the same exact lecture. They all have this history, these, these things happen, these things happen, and these things happen, and then they get the test. And they're going to measure three things about these students and what happens during the process of just during this part here. So during <coughs> that last segment, they take more notes, a lot more notes, comparatively speaking. And their mind wanders a lot less. They're not daydreaming near as much. And on the test they actually give them, they do distinctly better. It's as if not giving them the answers, make, giving them a question that they don't actually know the answer to makes them realize, huh, I ought to pay more attention, maybe take some more notes. And it, somehow or other, they make sense out of this experience and it ends up in more effective learning for them. So I think this can be explained as what's called metacognition, which is this term here, which is knowing about your thinking or knowing what you know. And the example I use is one day I was teaching my daughter to drive, and we're driving over to the stop and shop where she worked, and she said, oh, Dad, what's that button do? And I said, oh, it does this. And we stop, I drop her off, and I said to myself, I'm not really sure what that button does. I thought it did this. I had to park the car and put it in neutral and pull out the manual to find out, yes. When you said question and answer, do yes. you mean you give them the question and you give them the answer? Yes. Oh, not you give them the question and you ask them to fill in the answer. You, you provide them with the answer. Before they have a chance to answer. Correct. You get them together. Right. Yes. Okay. Yep. And there's this thing called the feeling of knowing or the illusion of competency, which is when you give someone a question and an answer, they say to themselves, I know that. Of course I know that. But when you don't give them the answer, it turns out they might not know that. And that's an example of that, I think. So this process of knowing what you do know, so that last thing there, they think they know. And when the answer is not provided, they realize, oh, I don't know. So that's knowing what you know and knowing about your understanding and appreciating that. That's, I think, one of the most important drivers of, of education. And it is only through this process that you realize you have a discrepancy. And when you realize you have a discrepancy in what you know or what you believe or understand, that drives you to say, I don't know. I have to go back and reread it, re-encode it, talk to someone who can clarify my understanding so that I can know better because I realize I don't know. And that process is quite, quite fraught. Most of us aren't that good at that. 
So this is an example of how, we, how much we know about stuff. These are, uh, again, college students, the famous college student. And they're, they're given a paragraph to read. This is sort of one of these science-y type things and, um, about glaciers or boats or something. And then they're randomized to estimate what they have learned after reading that paragraph. Another group has to first summarize what they learned with their pencil and paper. And then they're given an opportunity to estimate what they learned. And the third group is given a delay, a time delay of about 15 minutes or so. And then they get the middle thing. They get summarize what you learned and then estimate what you learned. And after that, the question is, who is most accurate at knowing what they actually learned? It doesn't mean who knew the most. It's who was most accurate in knowing what they knew or not knowing what they, or realizing that they don't know something. And the following picture tells, tells the story. Those who had a delay first were much more accurate in realizing what they did and didn't know. This is true not only for information, or what I call stuff, facts, but also conceptual knowledge, too. It's a much more sophisticated uh, cognitive processing than simply information. So <coughs> the, gra the graph for the uh, inferences and so on, it looks the same as that. So I think this is why that works. Our, our short-term memories are incredibly tiny, and, and they don't hold much information. And whether it gets replaced with new information or fades is an ongoing debate. The review article I read, I didn't read the whole thing. It was 100 pages, and, I, and the guy kept saying it's so difficult to know. And you read the experimental evidence to trying to figure out whether it's fading or replacement. It's super hard. It's actually a difficult process to determine that. So I don't know why it is short-term memory goes away, but it goes away, and it goes away pretty fast. And once it's gone, mm. So I think what happens is when it's in short-term memory, you can recollect it easily. You think you know it, and then it's gone for whatever reason in 15 minutes or something. And then that's when you realize, yeah, I don't know that. I, I don't know Keith's dog name. Ben, what was it? Uh, so, and so it goes. So this is how I, I recommend to my, my learners who tell me that they're having trouble remembering stuff, who aren't, they have no actual damage or problems. It's this process. So I tell them to take a break and then try and recall what they, what they, what they read. And you'll find after 15 minutes of being away from the book, it's not that easy. Uh, when you fail, you have to go back and re-encode or look at the material. I do consider handwritten notes to be handy because you're processing the information when you're writing it. You're re-encoding it into something you understand. And I think that's the nature of its utility. And then if you want to, doing the same process as this a day after so you're spacing things out. A delay of a day is quite effective. So this is, we'll move on to stuff about understanding, which it turns out is, is more of an interest to me. The stuff thing is more, uh, well, it's just stuff. So I do have faculty come to me and tell me that people are the smart people, the nice people, but they don't seem to get it. They don't put it all together and integrate the material that well. What can we do about that, if anything? <coughs> and so I think these two words here are the key words uh, for, for the process. One is the process of constructivism, which I'll show you, and then the process of deliberate discourse when you're discussing things between people and how you use that is the potent item that drives, I think, the, the constructivism in the mind. So when people get taught something new, this little diagram shows you what happens. For all of you who can see this, uh, this thing is a fish. He's been talking to the tadpole who grew up to be a frog and went into the land and came back and described birds. So the fish is now imagining what a bird looks like. And if you look at that, do you think that looks like a bird? There's elements of a bird there, but it's a fish decorated as a bird. It's a bird fish. And that's because the fish uses its prior memory as the constructive item on which it builds the new information. So this is very typical as to how things, how things go for humans, uh, the mistakes that we make in our minds. So constructivism, this is a great quote out of a paper. Uh, it was published a couple years ago. Constructivism, that's this concept. Uh, maintains that individuals incorporate new information into the previous conception and that they only change their ideas when they realize that the new information conflicts with their previous understanding, creating cognitive dissonance. And I've colored, I've colored certain words pink because I, I, I read this initially and it didn't occur to me, and then I read it again and again, and at one point it jumped out at me, it's all about them. Look at how many theirs and them. It's all about what's going on in their mind. The 
the pink. It's, it's what's in, in an individual, their thought, their thought, they realize, and all this stuff. It's all about what's going on in the mind of the learner. What I know is kind of irrelevant. It's what's happening in the mind of the person. And this constructivism de defines a type of practice, exercises that challenge previous conceptions and require people to explain themselves. Because when that fish explains that bird, you know you got a problem because he's going to say, well, it's got some scales, it's flying through the air. Like, sc whoa, scales? And birds don't have scales. And you right away know that the construction that they've engaged in to create the bird in their mind is not correct. So I think that's a, a nice way to think about it. So these are the words that I help my faculty or hope my faculty will use in talking with learners, doctors who are trying to figure out what to do, why to do it, and so on, make the best decisions for patients. Why? And, and one of the elements here about why is I ask my learners, my doctor people, um, even when they make the best decision I could ever imagine, and I'm so delighted that they made it, I just look at them and say, why do you want to do that? Why not that? And then they have to explain and defend their position as to why they want to do this versus that. Maybe they got lucky. Hmm, who knows? It's not a mean thing to do, but it's a great way to find <coughs> out what they actually know because they have to explain and expound on things. What are these other terms you see here? <coughs> And by asking these questions, you hear all sorts of stuff. And you hear all about birds with scales when you do this. <laughs> so I, I, that's just a repeat of what I said. Even if something sounds like a great decision. And when things come up and they're funny, that's the way I, where I say it. Sometimes that's a curious thing to say. Then you can get busy on unpacking that and correct, correcting the, the understanding that the person has in their own mind. This is one of the key things I've, I've used in the last couple of years, because I'm busy. <laughs> Healthcare is busy. And so if you, can, if you can get like a resident or a fellow to explain to a medical student something and then sit back and listen, wow, you learn a lot about what they understand, how they understand it, and so forth. And that allows you to then realize where your education or teaching and, and so on can go next, because it is very revealing. So this is something that I don't know if this will, uh, it will actually be germane even to th stuff that's very cognitive. Um, so I'm walking down the hall, I kid you not, the, one of my senior faculty comes to me and says, Baker, we've got a problem, this resident, there's something wrong, they, they don't listen. And uh, I know they, they can hear, so that's not that problem. But they say they're smart, but they just can't seem to follow instructions. And they're not willfully, uh, uh, you know, being, being disobedient, they're, they're actually not able to follow the instructions. And so this really comes to bear in, in things that are new for you. So this was first studied, um, there was a paper, I think, at Carnegie Mellon about coding, about writing computer codes. And they realized that uh, people don't attend to information when they're busy doing something. And I'll show you what this looks like in, in my domain of healthcare. So uh, these limits are what, are what gives rise to these problems. One is working memory capacity uh, and cognitive load. And then the other is analogical transfer. This little picture. Is, uh, was written by uh, Dr. Mayer. He's the guy who talks about cognitive load theory and so on, and multimedia multitasking. And this picture shows how we get information. You hear stuff, you see stuff, you can do both at the same time, like you are right now. And then that information comes into your working memory, which, if I use my fingers, I, there's no such a place in the mind, but in my mind, it's that big, the grain of salt. It's the tiniest spot in the brain. And in that place, we put together and make understanding. That's where we take information and understand it. We pull from prior knowledge and integrate, there's my little integral sign, in working memory. That's where we invent the little fish. You're listening to the tadpole say, yeah, the bird looks like this and that. And you're like, oh, yeah, sure, it's got scales and so on. Uh -huh. And that's all going on in working memory. Right now, what you're doing when you're listening is using working memory. You're sitting to yourself going, this doesn't make sense, or that, wait a second, that all that's working memory. If I ask you to do 2 to the third power plus 7 square root of, what's the answer? And I, and I did not give you a piece of paper, that would all be in working memory, and you can figure out how well that would go. It's not easy to do. This is the tiniest place in the brain from what I can tell. And so it's tremendously limiting for all of us. So this, you can only attend to a couple elements at a time, and that's what I mean. I'm going to show you a picture of this shortly. It's a graphical uh, experiment. Well, the display is graphical. And the, the visual image is very clear as to how this works. And we've talked about 
active learning, which is when people take what they know and try and put it together with new information to make new sense, and that's the constructivism concept. There's my little birds. So this, this is, uh, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with what's called laparoscopic surgery, it's, it's all the rage now, we do a lot of it, and uh, that simply means that uh, a surgeon puts little tools in you through little portholes, and then uh, they have cameras on the end of them, and they look at a screen. So one could liken it to a video game. So they have the, the tools in their hand that are attached inside the body, and they're looking at a screen like that. Over there is the screen, and they can see what they're doing. Uh, they're looking over there. So what they're going to do in this experiment is they're going to take very experienced surgeons, that's this group here, and then the resident surgeons, they've had, you know, been doing this a couple years, but not terribly long. These people have done many, many hundreds of these procedures. These have done, you know, 50. And they're going to ask them, while they're watching the screen, to tie some knots. And you can see that the, the senior surgeon ties a nice knot. The scores are very high. The learners, not so much. That's our baseline. That's, making the, that's just making knots. This here is the easy task. You're not going to be doing anything. You're just going to sit there and look at the screen. Over there, there's the laparoscopic screen. And it's going to put little plus marks or something in various spots on the screen. All you got to do is tap the pedal when the little spot comes up. It's easy. Everyone gets 100% because they can see. So the fun part is saying to them, now all you got to do is tell me when you see the little spots and just tie some knots while we're doing it. That's it. That's all you got to do. Same exact, same exact game as this, except tying the knots. And at this point, the residents go blind. This is a spectacular failure of something they can do 100% correctly. It is a very, very simple task. And yet, when they need to use their working memory capacity to control the knot, how hard should I pull? Is that the colon? What am I doing? That process just ruins their ability to attend to other visual stimuli and verbal stimuli as well, which is why when the faculty was talking to the junior resident doing a new procedure, the resident appeared to be deaf. They were so jazzed about, I'm putting a needle way deep in the human back, I have to be careful, that everything coming in is off. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. The part that impresses me that even the attending surgeons missed a bunch of these, that surprised me. Surprised me a lot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So one of my favorite studies is this one here. This is from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. It's just so elegant. It's crazy. When you see the simplicity of the study and then you, I mean, the visual, and then you read this paper, you're like, wow, that, that is impressive. So anyways, it's one of my favorite studies just because of the elegance of what these people did. So it's a really simple, simple study. So here's the study. You're going to take people and you're going to have them walk the periodic track, the little oval thing or sit in a chair, or w walk on this aperiodic track, this thing here. And they have to learn, learn some new words while they're doing it. That's it. It's really simple. Sitting down, walking an oval, tra tra uh, 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 oval thing, and this aperiodic track. Who learns the most? How's this go? And this is what it looks like. Walking, something we do every day, all day, since we were very young. Talk about an automatic procedure walking. And doing that on this little oval track, and never mind the aperiodic track, degrades your ability to learn very substantially. I am very impressed at this limitation, but that's an example of it. And then this here, the, the lower lane, anyone want to guess at the difference between the red dot group and the black dot group? They're different groups of people. What might differ? How might they differ? I won't touch that. I'm not touching that. <laughs> age. Who said age? Bingo. Yeah. Sadly for me, this is my group. Well, I'm, I'm taking offense to that. <laughs> someone, someone said last time, how old are these people? So these are, you know, these people are in their, I think they're in the 70s, and these people are probably in their 20s. So substantial age difference. But that's known. This is not, not really a surprising finding. The part that surprised me is that something as Every day, as walking to, can degrade your cognitive skills that impressively. So the point here is that learners use their entire working memory capacity when they're doing something new, uh, and it leaves no cognitive bandwidth for anything else, really anything else at all. And so 
uh, during any kind of task completion feedback that you're giving someone while they're doing it, while they're writing computer code, anything you're doing while you give them feedback at the same time, you might as well just, just go watch TV. It's going to have the same effect. They can't hear you. So when I have a, a, a physician that I need or I want them to listen to me, I say, put down the needle, put down the thing, stop doing the task, and we'll talk. So once they disengage, their working memory capacity is now here available. We talk, we have a, uh, I might give them some suggestions. But if you do it while they're doing the, the task, or doing anything, even cognitive, forget hand-eye coordination, even just doing a process like presenting, same difference. For us, this is something we do some of nowadays. You've heard of simulation, I expect. This is the concept where you mentally rehearse something and you get it down to the point where it's sufficiently routinized that you free up some working memory capacity to do a little more learning at the same time. That's one of the concepts there. Do you know what the term bootin means? What's that? Do you know what the term bootin means? No. Or did you say bootinized? No, routinized. Oh, I thought you said bootinized. No, I hope I didn't say anything offensive. No, no, no. <laughs> is a piece of that that's oh, yeah, okay. Bhutan, yes, thanks. Bhutanized. Ah. Uh, I'm being <laughs> so this is something that I think will resonate with, uh, with you all pretty straight, straightforward manner for a couple reasons. One is we, we do this all the time in terms of problem solving. I think of MIT as a place where you might do some problem solving. Um, and when I was going to college and so on, it was this concept, you apply your knowledge. And it was said to us as if that would just happen. You see, you do some problems like this, you learn the principles, and then you apply your knowledge. And I didn't realize it, and the person telling me to do that, I don't think realized that this, this, is not, this is not easy for us people. This doesn't work very well at all. It is stunningly difficult to do, and I didn't appreciate it until I saw the science of it. So this little concept here, there's a, the, what's called the surface structure, and that's what the problem looks like. And then there's the deep structure, and I've made it hard to see because it's hard to see. Those are the core features of the problem. That's what you need to, to understand that you can take these, this surface structure problem and map it all the way over to that apparently unrelated problem <coughs> by the deep structure, not the surface structure. And humans, for whatever reason, we key in on surface structure. So once we see surface structure, we think that's going to have the solution built into it. And most of us can't see the deep structure beneath the hood. And then we're stuck with inability to transfer the information. So have you all seen this video? I don't recommend doing it right now, unless you want to walk out. This is, this, is, this is crazy. And this gives an example of what this looks like. These are MIT graduates, or so they say. And there's a professor there who's supposedly from MIT. I've not checked. And um, I don't know if they were engineers or not. But um, they were given the small task that you would think anyone could do, and it turns out no one does. And it's amazing. And there's nothing wrong with the folks, of course. They're bright folks. Matter of fact, they think one was a valedictorian. But this is a very simple thing you can do on YouTube and play that and see how it does not work. Uh, for, if you want to tell somebody or teach someone how to do a new item that's related, lots and lots and lots of examples will be a, a friend of yours in terms of getting them to, to use that knowledge in a related area. So knowledge rep or example repetition. The part that is a lot harder is this concept of if you want someone to do what's called a far road transfer, like a big transfer far away that's not even closely related to the surface, then teaching in uh, with things called abstract concepts is much more effective. And they've, they've studied this with mathematics. Most people think of mathematics and they think of the fours and the eights and this, and then there's a plus sign somewhere, and then they do something, and out comes the answer. And that's great if you want to teach it for that kind of a number. But if you want them to transfer the concept of addition to a new area, you have to teach, or not have to, but you're much more effective in transfer if you do it with abstract principles and abstract items. So you don't anchor on the surface, and you can see the deep stuff much better. And so uh, I don't have the study sitting here. I didn't show it. But there's a very nice study in science showing the much more effective transfer when you do abstract principles as opposed to concrete examples. And this is a, I like this because it's a, it's a very nice graphical example of, of transfer or not. The top, uh, what we have here is the, on the y-axis, the fraction correct. And they're doing a little task, a very simple task on the top in the black dots. And the, the red dots are much more difficult task. And at the dotted line here, you have to transfer to a new but very reasonable homolog. 
And so I liken this to tying my left shoe, tying my left shoe, tying my left shoe, and then they say, oh, tie your right shoe, buddy. And I'm sure I can do that. Th that's a very simple transfer. Tie the right shoe, you can tie the left shoe. Um, in terms of healthcare, um, if you think of learning about myocardial infarction and the physiology underneath that, it's a very straightforward process. You have an arterial tree, it's got plaque in it, a plaque ruptures, and that's a heart attack. Then if you say, tell me what happens in a stroke, if you don't have any idea about the underlying structure, you go, I don't know, why can't the guy speak? And the answer is because they've had plaque rupture, ischemia, and failure of the end organ. It's the same exact deep structure, identical. But the surface structure is radically different, and because of that, people are stuck not able to make that transfer until you map it for them and show them. They go right down to unable. So I think this is true. There's lots of people trying to come with little apps to help this stuff, but <coughs> so far it's not working too well. So I think these cognitive limits are, are quite real and, and almost always present. And so given that, I think this demands the following conclusion right there. So, uh, because of that, I try and maintain, for all of the education I do with the, the learners I interact with, is maintain this thing called a growth mindset, which you've probably heard about, I suppose. Um, so the question I have for my learners, and especially in healthcare, is a bit of a problem, I think, uh, in terms of wanting to show that you're good at something. That competes very much with wanting, wanting to be very, it can compete with wanting to be very good at what you want to do. So. This sort of stuff happens to the people I know. It happens to me. These things that are not very fun, they're challenges or setbacks or difficulties or failures. Your choice of words, they're all true. And so the question is, when you have a setback or a difficulty, you can't understand something, you can't make something happen, you can't make the transfer, um, can't learn the material, don't understand something. To me, that's normal. And so given that, how do you address the learner? And how, how should the learner deal and cope with that or respond to that problem? And so I asked them to frame things in a mastery-oriented manner, which is where your goal is very singular. Your goal is to understand the material. Your goal is to, uh, is to learn this new item, this new technique. In contrast, there's this thing called the performance orientation, which I think is about validating your ability. And that goal is to make sure everyone else thinks you're great at what you do. Or in other words, make sure no one thinks you're a clown at what you do. So you want to, so, so with this response to a setback, you, you would want to hide your setback. And I'll give you a cute study, or a cute story. One of my uh, relatives who was in college, otherwise known as my daughter, um, was taking organic chemistry. And she said, Dad, I can't do organic chemistry. I said, what do you mean you can't do organic chemistry? She said, I can't do it. I said, it's impossible. And I said, well, so how much are you studying? She said, oh, about an hour a week. I said, I think I know your problem. <laughs> so she was adopting, I can't do it attitude. I'm not made for this. and so if you don't have that, if you think you can't do it, you would, an effective thing to do would be to quit. It's not, not effective at getting you to learn organic chemistry, but it's, it's an, an effective uh, response if you think you can't do something. If you think, however, effort and mastery are the things to use, then you would want to do a mastery orientation. So people who have a strong learning orientation with the, what we call growth mindset, that was slanged up by uh, uh, Kahn and uh, Carol Dweck. I think it's a much more effective word. Uh, and so it's the act of striving towards the development of competence in whatever it is you're dealing with, whatever, whatever you're struggling with. You want to conquer it, so to speak. In contrast, this performance or validation goal or orientation is this, seeking to validate your ability, get favorable judgments. And in, in healthcare and medical school, what they have found is that students come in, they have a largely, as a body of people, they are learning oriented. And then as they go through medical school, they become increasingly performance oriented and less learning oriented. That to me is a tremendous, that's, that's awful because that means their mindset towards understanding things or struggling through difficulties is that has been sort of culturally messed up. So this is our, these are examples of how people might respond if they have these different mindsets. I think you can read them just to sort of make sense of what learning orientation looks like or validation or performance orientation looks like. You guys know that probably. So this is what this, this was sent to me by one of my my uh, trainees after they had uh, worked with me for a while. She knew I liked this, and so this is Sal Khan's latest uh, 2014 comment that mindsets mattered more than anything else because I think it gets you past difficulties when you don't understand, you know, three-dimensional this or that. Then with this mindset, you you continue to 
approach the material until you understand it, which I think is, for me, that's what I want. <coughs> and for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this, I simply should tell you it works better, and, and show you these things. So the learning orientation concept versus validation orientation, uh, firstly, they are, they are orthogonal to each other. You can be high in one, high in the other, and any combination you want, because they are essentially unrelated to each other. So what I ask for my learners to do is always be pushing towards learning orientation, and I leave the uh, learning oriented and leave the performance oriented alone. I don't mess with that. Instead, uh, focus on growing this. So the responses to setbacks are distinctly uh, more effective with learning orientation. It can be increased by primes and environment. The fact that it goes down in medical school is a good example of the environmental pressures downward. Medical students, I already told you that. Teachers prefer, prefer students with learning orientation because when they don't understand a question, what do you think a person who has a learning orientation does in class when they don't understand something? That's it. They do this. Excuse me, I don't get it. Because they're, they're they want to learn the stuff. And if you have a performance orientation and you want to show everyone you're really smart, do you put your hand up in class and say, I don't get it? No, no way. So, so I think probably that's why students like, or teachers like, the engaged learning oriented student. There are also studies saying that they engage in deeper, more sophisticated understanding of material. Uh, they accept negative feedback better, which I think is handy. That's another long process. But conceptually speaking, negative feedback for a learning oriented mindset is fantastic. That tells you what you need to do to get better. You want it. You don't enjoy it. No one likes getting thwacked. But, but you know, being told that you did it wrong or so, and that's not fun, but it's useful. It's actually diagnostic material to improve, and that's your goal. It harmonizes very nicely with your goal. But negative feedback, if your goal is to look good in front of others, is kind of counter goal. So you don't want that. So in medicine, this is something that we, we run up against quite a lot. A learning orientation increases information sharing with colleagues. This was done with petroleum engineers looking at sharing. And it makes sense. If you want to understand something, you're likely to share it. If you're competitive with others and want to look better than someone else, you do not want to share. Think of medical school. What do they call them? Uh, they have a name for the, the, in college when they're uh, gunners. You know, you, you don't share your notes with anybody because you want the A. It's that concept. That's what this. But the petroleum engineers, those who are more learning oriented, shared a lot more information with their engineering colleagues. These were international scientists. This study came out not too long ago with uh, scientists that were in the medical domain. They studied, di they studied diabetes. And those that engaged in much more collaborative research had higher incidence of learning orientation amongst themselves as a group. Again, the concept of sharing and understanding. And I've already mentioned this, that learning orientation is unrelated or orthogonal to, to performance orientation. So I just messed with the one. So this is my, if you want to have questions, happy to chat with you now. Tried to keep in relatively short. There's lots of stuff I left out, and I apologize for that. But we have plenty of time for questions. Of you to say thank you. Uh, yeah, my dad said if someone says. Very impressive. Oh, who knew? Thank you very much. Common Core. Is Common Core learning orientation? You know what Common Core is? I've heard of it on the news, uh, but no. I mean, it's, we're looking no. our kids with it. Okay. It's, not, it's the opposite of the learning oh. organization. This is really state of art. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, so how I learned about it was my goal. My goal for training the young doctors is I want them to be experts. I don't want them to be adequate. I want them to be terrific. So how do you make a fantastic doctor? You have to know how to teach them more effectively. I think the ways we teach our medical residents in hospitals today is suboptimal by a big margin. And so with that goal of wanting to help my learners learn better, that's where that came from. And the other concept was um, I was finding a lot of the students uh, weren't raising their hand in conference. I was mystified by this. I'm like, why don't they answer the question? Why don't they ask the, either answer the question because they know it, or raise their hand because they don't know and ask the question. I couldn't understand that. So I began to learn about the goal orientation stuff by Carol Dweck back in the late 80s because I was really mystified as to why you wouldn't put your hand up if you did not understand something because that's the only way you would get to learn it. And I wanted to help my learners, so I try and push a culture of, in the faculty and the residents 
of learning orientation, which means when the resident makes a mistake, you say, okay, let's figure out what to do to make it better. You don't get busy poking them in the eye or teasing them or mocking them or none of that. Yeah. So I think what you mentioned there is sort of the key part of Dweck's work in the sense of it's about the culture of the setting in which those people are situated and how they start to feel that that's the accepted norm. So I'm curious about the work that you've done with your colleagues mm -hmm. and, and how you've tried to help them with that work mm -hmm. because it's such a key part of getting students to feel comfortable in that setting. So it comes from a variety of things. So firstly, to tell you how we do our evaluation process. We don't give our students grades, so to speak. We give them scores, and they're allowed to see them because they are their scores. And I tell them, don't look. You all think you're above average, because that's what you think. And on average, the way we do our system, we normalize the whole thing. So by definition, you're average. And if you do the statistics on it, look, two thirds of you cannot be shown to be different than average or below average. Ooh, that's super painful. That means only a third of you are actually above average by statistics. So asking is risky business. And the goal is simply to get better, and I don't care how good you are. We tell, we tell our applicants when they come in, you're fancy, we know you're fancy, you're smart. <laughs> that's great. We're not gonna ask you if you're fancy. The question is, can I make you a little more fancy, a little bit better at what you do? That's the goal, and so there's, it, it's a floating system. If there are real performance problems, that's another story, and we have processes for that. But as far as the faculty goes, they, they, we share this information. We have workshops with them about what it is we're trying to do. And the residents know how to ask questions. So there's a language they start to use. And if a resident says, oh, you know, the faculty is so performance oriented. I'm like, well, okay. So now I understand the problem. And so then I might talk to the faculty and say, hey, you know, if you recapitulate it this way or that way. And one thing I found to be strikingly effective was uh, when a, an attending or a faculty member gives feedback that's in a way that's injurious, harmful. So-and-so is so stupid and all this, whatever they want. So it's some mean stuff. And, and then they get in trouble for saying it because the resident comes crying and all that. So then I go back to the attending and say, well, you probably had some truth in what you're saying. I guarantee you some of what you said came from somewhere. You're bothered by something probably real. Can we reframe it in a way and recode it, so to speak, re restate it in a way where what your concerns are are there without the injurious stuff. And if you help someone rewrite something a few times, they can see, oh yeah, so that's my problem, that's what I'm bothered about, that right there. And yeah, I don't need all this other you know, stuff that's the uh, injurious stuff. And I've done this with a couple faculty and been surprised they're autopilot after not too many of these events. Uh, but it, not everyone subscribes to it. There's the group that thinks, no, you know, you gotta really let them have it. And, and those people don't do well with our, with our learners and they don't spend as much time with them either because we have a system for that too. <laughs> yeah. So if we were a, a group filled with high school teachers today in a typical high school in the Massachusetts or in America, how, what kind of advice would you give us to look at how we could incorporate some of these um, approaches and aspects to rethink teaching that happens at younger levels? Um. I don't know a lot about what goes on in high schools these days. <clears throat> um, I do think that if you give folks opportunities to discuss amongst themselves things and work as a group, they're more collaborative. Having people strive for deeper learning where you can give partial credit for understanding and let the surface come, stuff come later. My, 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 my physics teacher in, in high school got himself fired after two years or so because he wouldn't give an A out. Because, you know, someone would always make a mistake and put the decimal point in the wrong spot or forget units. He would die about and forgetting the units. Millimeters of what? Squared? Cubed? And, and so kids would get these Bs. Um, so I don't think he did himself any favors, but because a lot of the students could understand stuff, but he got them on details and would just poke them in the eye relentlessly, which didn't help. I mean, that stuff's important, but not when you're learning concepts. Um, so, and then, and then how you treat students who ask questions and how you role model that, I think is really important. So when a student asks a question and it shows they've missed the boat, the way to deal with that is say, okay, 
How did you come to understand that? Tell me more about that. Which is to say, engage them, listen to them, and help them, and help them publicly. And, and uh, God, God help the one who teases them. Say, that's not how we're going to talk about this. And he's learning. He wants to learn, and you need to listen to him and entertain his question. So I think that kind of concept is very helpful. If they see you, you know, teasing students or laughing at them, then you're done. Yeah. I have a question about your, uh, the research that you had earlier about the pencil and paper versus yes. the typing notes. Do you know of any research that's been done and is the difference between pencil and paper and like stylus and tablet? Oh, I don't know. I would hypothesize that stylus and tablet is the same as pencil and paper because what's happening that I think is that the information comes in and you have to make some sense out of it. You have to shorthand it. And when you make that shorthand, you're re-encoding it. There's something active going on. And whether it's just, I think, my guess is that's what would happen. Yeah, and the great, the great typists will sit there and talk to you about dinner while they're typing at the same time. I mean, that's how automated that can be. So I don't think there's as much processing as, so I think, I think that's the difference if I had to guess. Yeah. Uh, do you have any more uh, advice on analogies? Because teaching through analogies is, is really difficult. Yes. Yet it, it really enhances the speed that you would make an organization of learn. So I'm just wondering if you've done any hmm. So I've done no work on it per se. The, the, the transfer stuff is um, getting, getting a lot of attention, I'd say. The, there's some pretty good studies about it. Um, and you pay a price when you teach abstract. So there's a very fun study that I didn't show you. And it, and it, and it, it goes like um, it's a problem solving thing. So they, they randomize the people. And they, they have to read a passage and memorize the passage or solve the problem that the passage is about. And, and then they'll have to try to solve the problem at the end. So the group that has to memorize it has to try and solve the problem. The group that tried to solve the problem has to try and solve the problem. And they all get it wrong because it's really hard. It's, a, it's an analogical transfer with some distant transfer. They all fail. Then they give them a, uh, another problem that's a, a homologue. So it's, it's, you have to do another transfer. The students who memorized and they get nothing. But the people who tried and failed, distinctly better. And then when you ask what, what did they know of what they read, the group that did the, under, the understanding and the transfer version tried to solve it and failed, they don't remember very much. This group remembers a lot. So that's a, recu a recurring finding, is if you want to learn stuff, information, it seems to be different than understanding. Uh, there has been some recent advance on that where if you can force the use of the information to engage the stuff, it will get incorporated into the understanding and you'll have both. But that's, that's, those are very fancy studies. I'm not sure they generalize across uh, the broader stuff. Trying and failing seems to be the best way to, I think, manage that problem right now, which is to say failure is good, failing to learn is effective, so it's another thing I tell my faculty is failing is very, we don't love failing. Failing is not something to clap about. But when it happens, it's a great, it's a more effective learning for understanding, for transfer, for deeper learning, for math, for physics. It's better. Having failed is actually, it bothers people greatly in their mind. And then when you then give them the answer, something better happens. So you're better off with that than, than not. We've run out of time, but thank okay. you so much. Thank you for having me.